Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, Brian Moynihan, CEO and Chairman of Bank of America. Brian, we have to say thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's great for you to be here. These talented teammates are out working early in the morning and hopefully making some money for the shareholders. It's getting noisy. We can talk about how much money they're making in yeah. just a moment. I actually <laughs> wanted to start with a quote from Liz from the Bank of America Institute in the first hour of our coverage here. I find this stunning every time I read it. This will be the fifth time already today. Medium value of savings and checking balances are more than 40% higher than 2019 for all income levels. As you look across the business, consumers, companies, just how resilient is this, is this economy still? Well, Liz and the team do a great job of putting this out, and we purposely created the institute so we could get this data out. And it's not a reflection of what's coming tomorrow, it's more a reflection of what you see in the past, and it, but it's very granular, 60 plus million customers, very, 37 million uh, checking account holders, and they have been remarkably resilient. And so the idea, uh, if we were sitting here last year, this time we'd be talking about, a, our team was predicting a recession somewhere early this year. Um, it didn't, then they took that off the table as you move through the year, and now they're predicting you know, 2% plus growth for this quarter. So you've gone from uh, negative to slightly positive 2%. That is re- returning to the mean. Return- it's not you know, outsized growth. It's actually slowing down. So people can't forget we're going from a 4 to 5% growth rate to 2.5% growth rate. It's slowing down. And, our, and the, the restriction on economy accomplishing its purpose. Meanwhile, the consumer is very resilient. And that's providing an anchor to windward that the Fed has latitude that a lot of places don't have that they can be hold restrictive and let the economy really catch up. But they have to be mindful of the change. At some point, that consumer will slow down, and they have slowed down their spending. And so last year, it had been 10% growth. This year, in the fall, 5%. Now it's down to 3 to 4%. And they've got to be careful they don't overshoot. So this is the tension we're in right now, which is this resilient economy. And actually, as you said, Lisa, actually trying to bring inflation down for since the financial crisis to now, most central banks are trying to get inflation up. And so it's a completely different execution, and, and that's what we've got to get right. You're dominant in small business lending. Yeah. I'm just wondering just how much confidence there is out there still in corporate America at the lower level, in the small companies across this country. If you say by virtue of their activity, it's strong. But on the other hand, line usage, and Wendy will be on here later, she'll talk about that. Line usage has come down a bit, which means that the cost of borrowing went up, and so therefore I'm a little more careful. And so hiring's a little more careful. Uh, equipment purchase, a little more careful. And so, well, they're f- fine making money, and the profits are strong, and the team will talk about profits driving this market and the, and the EPS estimates for public companies, even mid-sized companies are participating in that. The American economy is the dominant economy in the world right now in terms of activity and interest and investment and lots of good trends for it. But on the other hand, why aren't they using our line so much? It's a little more costly, therefore you're a little more careful. And that's that's the tension we're going through. Everybody's trying to really figure out how this economy will perform. And you know, four months ago, people worried about a recession. Six months ago, worried about a recession. Now they're not. But now the question is, do they really want to invest heavily in it? And that's where you're seeing that a little bit of tension here. So everything's fine, solid, resilient, all the words you want to take, but it has to sort of work the, the next uh, twist in the economy to get back to normal. It's funny, I, I hear some of uh, the people who work for you and they sound incredibly bullish. Nothing's wrong, whatever. Is it your job to basically look around corners and see what potentially could be the problem, but otherwise things are screaming and it suggests that even four and a half percent 10 year rates would be just fine for the lending and the activity that you're seeing. Well, I, I think we're also adjusting as a company and as an industry and as a society to a simple thing that from 2007 or 8 till 17, you had no interest rate. Then you had interest rate for about 24 to 36 months. Then they were dropping rates in 2019. Then the COVID comes and they drop. So we've never really had a normal interest rate environment. You know, what would have typically been a 3% you know, front end rate, 4 to 4.5% back end rate, a normal sloping curve, real interest rate. It hasn't occurred for anybody under 40. You know, they literally weren't working back then. So, and and I, that sounds curmudgeonly, but the reality is that's true. So everybody's adjusting this. So these high rates at four, four and a half percent in the ten year are not high rates in the grand scheme of things. They're high rates in the last fifteen years. So we got to adjust to that, and that'll take time to work through the systems and models and thought process. Our team is the best team in the world in research, and you're going to hear from a lot of them today, and and, and your viewers will benefit. On the other hand, you know, as you look at it more broadly, my job and the team's job at the top of the house is to make sure. 
we're balanced for all outcomes, and that's why we're always worried about what happens tomorrow when we play for it. The balance in outcomes is leading to some really frustrated and bored traders, and we talk about that with a lot of people who basically say there's not a lot to do because you can't really get an edge. Are you seeing that in trading activity? Are you seeing that in trading revenues as people basically have no incentive other than just to hold NVIDIA, hold on to you know some of the credit that keeps on rallying and just you know make bank? Well, our team has just come off of uh, last year uh, a record amount of revenues in the quarters, a record in growing quarter over quarter, and we think they're going to fare well this quarter. We told the market that a few weeks ago. And, and so Jimmy DeMar and the team that's out here, uh, the research team under Candace and the investment banking team on Matthew are driving the business and actually gaining share. And so while you know, pools are down investment banking, we've gained some share there. While pools are stable, flattish, we're actually up, and that's different in this business. And they do it with the right risk. They made money, I think, every trading day last year, nearly every trading day for the last five years. And so they, they do it the right way. Is that is that boring or not? You have to ask them. Uh, it's, it's just fine with us uh, because in the end of the day, that recurring capability, that ability to keep delivering for clients and doing what they need them to do and make money at it and deliver for the shareholders and get a return on capital is what Jim and the team have done a great job. You alluded to it. Have you maintained that momentum from that record fourth quarter? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, we we think we're uh, this this quarter start off well. The yeah. team's doing a good job, and yeah, you know, when you get to be bigger and bigger, it's hard to keep that growth going. They keep they keep doing it. Can we talk about the M and A slump as well? Are we working our way out of that? We wake up every single morning, we've got a new big blockbuster deal, and then we have a conversation about whether they can actually close it or not because of antitrust concerns down in Washington D.C. Do you find us exiting that slump this year? Is that what you're looking for? I, I think until there's a a clarity on policy, that question is going to come up every time a deal is announced. So the uh, the companies are actively engaging in the dialogue, trying to figure out the strategic moves, and then the question is, can they get the deals through? And that happens in all industries. We need to get this resolved. We need to get a, 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 a more rational, predictive outcome to have you know, people willing to take the risk of putting their company at risk for a sell side. And that's really what it comes down to. The buyers you know, put themselves somewhat at risk. Their sellers really put themselves at risk because a company, the uh, hanging in the bands for a longer period of time is a tough place to be. Having been there before in my life and having caused people to be there a lot in my life, you know, it, it's a tough place. And so how to run the company, what you can do. So I think we need to get a faster turnaround. The, the idea is these transactions don't change this month or a year from now. They're the same transaction. People need to get after them, look at them, decide what they're going to do, and give clarity so that the market take place. The good news is, you know, investment bank revenues have stabilized and moved back up, and that's good. Um, but the M&A piece is still the piece that could come on and push through. Do you find that some clients are reluctant to make deals based on what you just said? 100%. Even though they make business sense, they just don't even want to entertain the conversation. Because the risk reward balance is so tough. Not everybody has a staying power to fight through you know, lawsuits and time and effort and, and things like that. And so it, it really requires, a, you know, if you said you needed 10 points of strategic import out of 10 to, to do the, uh, to do it, 10 possible points, you might need seven before. Now you need all 10 because you really have to say this is worth hanging on to and fighting through. That, that, that's a different environment. Now, against that, you are seeing deals announced, and that's because they make strategic compelling sense for that uh, buyer, uh, seller, et cetera. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it's just been slowing things down. And, and I think as, as you get some rationality here and around the world, because remember, none of these deals are simple anymore. If for any company, they have operations in Europe where there's uh, uh, same sets of approvals or different sets of approvals and operations in other environments. But, you know, at the end of the day, consolidation comes because of strategic import, and I think you have to let capitalism run. So let's just talk about some of the policy shifts, which is nice, gentle allusion to the election later on. Potentially, they could offer some more certainty. What kind of M&A boom could you see after that certainty has been established? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, elections are elections. Uh, this company, the oldest part, has been around since 1784. And, you know, there's been a lot of elections since that time frame. And, you know, we have to just, people, I think you guys asked me in, in Davos, you know, do you have a drawer for one outcome? A drawer for, the answer is no. We just run the company and drive it. So, would you know, I think certainly around the election process here and around the world, we'll add to, okay, we got, we know what we're dealing with and go on. And so that'll create some energy. But I think we have to be careful to say one thing leans one way, one thing because, frankly, the politicians have to get this right for the good of their own state economy, the country economies and stuff. And I think they're all struggling with it. So we talk to a lot of strategists, poli political policy strategists, and they all say no one can really quite believe that it's Trump versus Biden again. And so they're trying to figure out who it's really going to be. Is it going to be you? 
I mean, what? Running for office. I mean, this is sort of what people are talking about. They're talking yeah. about Jimmy. I mean, this is sort of something that comes up in yeah, your discussions. Yeah, I've got a great job here. <laughs> I, I, I had a feeling you wouldn't put your hand out to be Treasury Secretary know, exactly. in front of the team this morning. I know, right? You want to make I've sure got a great job. At the end of the day, you know, our job, uh, my colleagues that are in the leadership across all industries, is to help any administration be successful, and that's what we try to do here and around the world. And, you know, and those are tough jobs, and, you know, but I, I don't think I'm running for office, so I think I've got a great job here, and I've got to <laughs> continue to do it and uh, try to help the, uh, this team and everybody be better than we could be tomorrow than we are today. There's been some fires to put out over the last 12 months in the industry. It's been a year since SVB failed. NYCB has been a new issue. Seems like last year was a rate shock, and this year just big worries about maybe a credit shock. Have you noticed any deposit flight coming towards you from regional banks in any way, shape, or form similar to what we saw 12 months ago? There hasn't, there hasn't been the kind of the change there was last year because you know, it, there are unique business models. That's what's not involved. A little bit of it, but and so nothing we're seeing. And by the way, we see a lot of flows and we don't see it anywhere. And the industry is well capitalized, has good liquidity. Believe me, from last year to this year, people short up their liquidity across the industry. Um, commercial real estate is a slow burn. It's a classic burn. In other words, if you go back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a rolling commercial real estate recession. And, and so there'll be difficulties and we work in that. But, you know, the the trading attitude, which is these assets got to move at a price tomorrow morning, isn't the way the banking system works. And frankly, that's the, the value of the banking system. We work with clients. We figure out what the, you know, you take a building, you figure out what the ultimate end state uh, rental roles will provide. You refinance it. Sometimes that wipes out the equity. Sometimes it doesn't. We're careful in how we underwrite as an industry. You know, the top 30 banks go through the stress test, which has a, a an effect that says, wait a second, if you're out uh, underwriting out in an odd way, that will, you have to put up the capital to prove your right before you even get the chance to prove your right. So in other words, your capital requirements reflect your underwriting today, even though recession may never come. And it reflects your underwriting commitments under a scenario where commercial real estate drops by 30 or 40 percent instantaneously. Instantaneously. So there's an effect on that on the industry, which is much more conservative building and much more middle of the road building, which is probably slow down the capital provision to some of these uh, companies. But on the other hand, it's not a bad thing when you get to this point. So I, we feel very good. Does that mean banks might fail? There's been thousands of banks have failed across the last 30, 40 years. That's what happens. Business models change. But on the other hand, the, the quality of the banking system is strong. When we caught up in Switzerland, we were talking about the prospect of a change in capital reserve rules. Chairman Powell in his semi-annual testimony appeared to back away from that. What was your reaction to what Chairman Powell had to say in the last couple of weeks? Well, we in the industry and we in Bank of America believe that we have, you know, tremendous amounts of capital, uh, liquidity. It's tested, the stress test. You know, we don't need to keep moving the rules around. We're clear about that. Um, and so, you know, I think as people look at this, they're saying sort of what's the reason. In the end of the U.S. banking system and the U.S. economy uh, are coexist with each other, and the U.S. economy has grown from pre-financial crisis now. The European economy has grown a lot less. The U.S. economy is much more vibrant. It's recovered from the pandemic shock faster. It's absorbed some of the things. And everybody says, well, that's because X, Y, or Z. But the reality is it's because the kind of capitalism protect, uh, uh, practice in the country is good, and the kind of banking system, financial system more broadly, helps that happen. And so, you know, we've weathered storms. Just think since, two, since, since early 2000, we've had a pandemic, recovery from pandemic, the fastest rise in interest rates, two kinetic wars on the ground, uh, a trade uh, 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 the debates around the world, shipping restrictions. You, you go through all this. In the end of the day, this industry, we made $100 billion after tax from 2020 to, through now. And we built huge reserves. We took them back. We dealt with the pandemic, $70 billion of borrow, borrowing overnight, a flood of deposits. Some of those deposits come out. That's the resilience of the system. And that's why we've got to be careful about adding capital and stuff when the perceived risk we don't think justifies. In the meantime, there has been a shift in terms of consolidation of market share yeah. in some of the bigger players. You were talking about how you were gaining market share. Who are you mostly gaining market share from? Is it the smaller banks? Is it from Europe? Where in particular? You, you know, each of our businesses, or eight lines of business, have different places they gain from. And, and so when it's the investment banking and the, uh, with Matthew Coder and the, and the trading team under Jimmy, that's largely coming from the long tail people. This business is hard. It requires about a billion dollars of technology investment a year to have a trading platform to keep up with it. So think about that. Wow. So when it's that hard, you know, that means people who don't get the returns on capital have quit and it's come this way. That's very different from the consumer bank where uh, uh, Dean Athanasia and Holly O'Neill and, and Aaron Levine that run that business force have just been driving core account growth 
in. So, uh, well, they give you the statistics about constant accounts. We've grown our consumer base probably uh, 4 million core checking accounts since the pandemic. So the deposits are up because of those extra balances. That's t- coming from everywhere. So we, it really comes from different places, but the idea is our job is to win the market and take it from every place. When you talk about the investment in technology, how much is that going to be an ongoing uh, benefit to a bank like yours that can invest in some of the artificial intelligence that we're hearing about every day? So I think if you think about we got to be careful about artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus digitization versus digital practice because it's all different things. But let, let me just give the simple stats. In 2010, we had 100,000 people in our consumer business. Today, we have 60. We had 6,000 branches at the high point about 2008. We have about 4,000 now. The comp- the, it is, we had about 400 billion deposits. Now we have 900 billion. The amount of transactions going through is light years bigger. And we're doing it with 40,000 less people. And the, the, the expense base we run the whole company on today, <clears throat> nominal expenses of $64 billion round numbers, is the same we ran on 2015. That is all, all the stuff you're talking about. That's supplying technology over and over and over again. And do we, are we perfect? Absolutely not. Do we have room to keep applying? Yes. Is there plenty ahead of us? It's unbelievable. And so if you look ahead, you know, we're basically running on neutral headcount. And everybody says, well, you're not hiring. We're hiring people in businesses and putting you know, revenue generation capabilities out there. At the same time, we're taking it out of the expense base. And, and that's a constant strain. And it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable what you can do. But it's, if there was some way you snap your fingers and change the whole thing, you would have done it. I mean, we're not... What not you just flying. said, though, is so important. And can we yeah. finish that? I was going to jokingly ask you whether we'll all be replaced by a big supercomputer in the next five to ten years. And I think a lot of the people behind us would like to know the answer to that question as well. But I guess effectively in the next five to ten years, are we effectively saying that each additional dollar of revenue is going to be less and less labor intensive because of this adoption of technology? We had 300,000 people. We have 212,000 a day. It's going to have less labor content. Are those people paid more? A lot more because the way the labor content shifts. Uh, and so if you think about it, 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 it will have less labor content because that is the expensive part, but it'll have more value added from labor because that's the way the, ma- uh, the mathematics will work. And so, uh, as you, so as you think about these trends, they're inexorable. They just keep going on. But people are forgetting these trends are already going on. And so one person's AI is another person's you know, algorithm models that traders have been using for years. One person's AI is another person's Erica, which is 18 million customers using it you know, every day type thing. And so you got to be careful about it. Is there potential here that we've never seen before? 110%. But the real question is, you don't have to wait for that potential. You're taking it out every day if you're working on it. No three-day week coming to Bank of America anytime soon. <laughs> is it Jamie who said that? Three-day week? I, I'm not sure I understand the math there, but uh, our team does a good job. They want to work five days. So I'm sure they, they do. Home. They're not in a way. Yep. Brian, it's good to see you. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Brian Moynihan there, the chairman and CEO of Bank of America.